Hi guys. So today I would like to talk about Martingale representation theorem. Uh, but before we do that, it's a good idea to actually review a few concepts related to filtration. And that's going to make the theory easier to understand. So let's go back to our example where we had a coin and let's, to let's toss the coin three times. So if we have a coin and we toss it three times, the possible outcomes are given by, we can either get a head, 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 or we could get a head, head, tail, or we could get head, tail, head, tail, head, head, or we could get head, tail, 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 head, tail, 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 head, or tail, tail, tail. Okay, so these are the eight possible outcomes we can get if we have a coin and we toss it three times. Okay, now what we would like to do is we would like to actually capture information that's available to us after we toss each coin. Okay, so we're going to create a, a, a series of sigma algebras given by F0, F1, F2, F3. And F0 would capture information that's available to us without tossing any coin. That's why we have a zero as the subscript. F1 basically signifies the information available to us after we toss the first coin. F2 likewise and F3 is basically information available to us after we toss the second and the third coin. Okay? And how we're going to construct these sigma algebras are, we're going to put in this sigma algebra all those sets which are resolved by the information available to us. Okay, so without tossing any coin, what is the information available to us? Well, we know that eventually the omega or the outcome of the experiment of tossing a coin three times is going to be one of these eight possible outcomes. Okay, but without tossing any coin, we really cannot say much about what these outcomes, which one of these outcomes is, is eventually going to be realized. The only thing that we can say about this omega is that it will definitely not be part of the empty set and it will definitely be part of our sample space okay so without tossing any coin this is the only information available to us and we put those sets in our sigma algebra and we say that these two sets are resolved okay now what information is available to us when we toss the first coin well again we can say that you know um, Whatever the, whatever the outcome that we get is definitely not going to be part of the empty set. It will definitely be part of our capital omega. And plus, when we toss the first coin, we'll either get a head or a tail. Okay? So we know that the first coin toss was a head. Okay? If first coin toss is a head, we can actually create a set that basically has these outcomes. Let's put here all the outcomes that basically start with a head. So we can put head, 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 tail head, tail, head, and head, tail, tail, okay? So we are put, in this set, we are putting all those outcomes that basically start with a head. And here, all these outcomes basically start with a head. That's why we're putting these outcomes in this set. Similarly, we can define another set, and here we're gonna put all those outcomes which basically start with a, with a tail. So here we can put tail, head, head, tail, head, tail, 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 head, tail, 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 right? Here, the first outcome is basically a tail. So we are basically putting it here. So when we toss the first coin, we'll either get a head or a tail. So the thing that we can say about the omega is, if we get a head, for example, we, we know for sure that the omega will basically belong in this set because the first coin toss was a head. And here, there are four possible outcomes which, and they all start with a head. So omega is going to be one of these four, right? So we can put a h in here. And likewise, we can put a t in here because this set is also resolved. So if you basically get a tail, then we know for sure that it basically is going to be in this set, okay? And not this set, okay? So these two sets are resolved as well. Now, when we actually put a set in our sigma algebra, we need to actually put the union and intersections and all that stuff. But if you take the union of these two, basically we'll get our sample space. So this basically is our full sigma algebra. Okay, so this basically captures the information available to us after tossing the first coin. And we say that these four sets are resolved uh, by the information of the first coin toss, right?
Now, likewise, we can do some similar exercise. So we want to actually now capture information available to us after we toss two coins. Okay, again, we're going to put empty set and our uh, entire sample space in here. Now here we're going to put other sets that can um, be described in terms of two coin tosses. Okay, so here we basically put sets which could be described in terms of one coin toss. Here we're going to put those sets which can be described in terms of two coin tosses. So we're going to put A of H H, A of H T, A of T H, A of T T. Okay, because after we toss two coins, we'll know what basically happened right in the first two coin tosses. We could either get a head head, head tail, tail head or a tail tail. So these four sets would be resolved um, after the second coin toss. And when we actually put these sets, we need to actually put the complements also. So here we're going to put the complement of this. Here we're going to put complement of head tail, tail head complement, tail tail complement. And now we need to start putting unions of these. So if we take union of AHH -H and AHT, that's nothing but A of H, right? Now here, if you take union of AHH, -H, union ATH, that's what we're gonna get. We can take AHH -H union ATT, ATT, so we're gonna put that as well. Now AHH, -H, AHT union AHH -H is already here. We Here we need, can, need to put AHT union A. H, we can put AHT union ATT and finally we can put union of this these two that's just gonna be A of T okay so we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 sets that basically are resolved after tossing the first two points and likewise we can actually write the sigma algebra generated by tossing three coins, but I'm not going to do that, okay? But it basically follows the same um, argument, okay? And the same procedure, how we basically calculate the sigma algebra so far. F3 would basically capture information available to us after we toss the three coins, right? Now, this basically, the sequence of this, uh, these sigma algebras is basically called a filtration, okay? So the basic idea is that as we, you know, uh, as we toss more and more coins, you know, the information available to us becomes more and more refined, okay? So for example, without tossing any coin, we really don't have much information about our omega. But after tossing the first coin, we can basically these four sets would be resolved. So we have more information about our possible omega. After tossing the, the first two coins, more sets are resolved. So we get more information about our omega and likewise that, that thing continues, okay? And other thing you can see from here is all the sets that basically are in F0 are also in F1 and all the sets which are in F1 are also in F2 and all the sets which are going to be in, which are in F2 will also be in F3. That basically is the property of filtration. So as we move forward in time, as we toss more and more coins, more and more information is available to us. Okay? So that basically was a concept of uh, filtration. Okay? And, you know, we've already talked about this uh, a few times before, but I just wanted to actually review this before we move forward. Now let's talk about what is uh, sigma algebra generated by a random variable. Okay. okay guys so now let's look at a stock process let's say we have a stock process whose initial value is 4 and if we toss a head in the first coin toss um, the stock will double up and if we toss a tail it will go down by half so every time we toss a head the stock doubles up every time we toss a tail stock goes down by half so S1 of H would then be 8 S1 of tail would be 2 and if we toss another coin we will get S2 of head head that would be 16 S2 of head tail which is equal to S2 of tail head would be equal to 4 and S2 of tail tail would be equal to 1 okay so this basically is a stock process we can actually extend it for another time period but for my example I'm just going to consider 
uh, stock process till time two. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to basically figure out what is the sigma algebra generated by S2. So S2 basically is a random variable and I want to know what is the sigma algebra generated by this random variable. And that we basically denote by sigma of S2. Okay, so this basically is the sigma algebra generated by S2. And what do we do here? We, in this sigma algebra, we're going to put all those sets, okay, which are resolved by knowing the value of S2. Okay, so let's assume that we basically are only observing the value of S2 and we know nothing about if we've tossed a head or a tail. Okay, so we basically are just given the values of S2. S2 can basically take a value of 16, 4 or 1 right and depending on what values s2 basically takes some sets would be resolved and those sets are going to be part of this sigma algebra so obviously phi and um, our sample space would be part of the sigma algebra okay now let's look at what set is resolved if s2 is equal to 16 okay if s2 is equal to 16 the only way we can get a 16 is when the first two coin tosses were both head okay that's the only way to get a 16 so if we if we see that s2 basically is at 16 then we know that the first two coin tosses were head head so a of hh basically is resolved okay similarly if at time two uh, the value of the stock was equal to one then we know that the only way we can get a one here is we basically toss a tail and a tail that's the only way we can get a one so we'll put in the sigma algebra we'll put a of tt also okay this set is also resolved now consider the situation where the stock basically takes a value of four okay if it takes a value of four and we know nothing about what point tosses have taken place then the only thing we can say is that either a head tail either we toss the head followed by a tail or we toss the tail followed by a head but we really cannot distinguish between if we toss the head first or a tail first right because looking at the value 4 we don't know which path the stock has taken we know that the stock must have taken this path or this path but we can't be really sure which path it's taken because we don't have that information available to us okay because we know nothing about the coin tosses we are only looking at the value of the stock right so then what set is resolved so if we see that the value of the stock is at 4, the only thing we can say is that A H T union of A T H is resolved. Okay? We cannot say if it's a head tail or a tail head. We can only say that this union is resolved that either it was a head tail or it was a tail head. Okay? And now in this, these four, these three sets are resolved and we, in this sigma algebra we also need to put all the union intersection complements etc which i'm not going to do okay but what's now happening is if you compare this sigma algebra to f2 okay you will see all the sets in the sigma algebra are also in an are also in f2 so for example phi and omega capital omega are here then we had a ahh ahh is here in f2 as well att a T T is right here. Okay, that set is also here. So this set is also in our in our F2. And A H T union A T H. A H T union A T H is also here. Okay. So all the sets that are basically part of the sigma algebra generated by S2 are also in F2. And if that's the case, we basically say that S2 is F2 measurable okay for s2 s2 to be f2 measurable basically all the sets generated by or, or, or the sigma algebra all the sets in the sigma algebra generated by s2 need to be in f2 okay but we also see that f2 has more sets than this um, uh, sigma algebra okay for example here we we have the set a h t and a t h these two sets are in f2 but they are not part of the sigma algebra generated by s2 okay in other words if we are looking at the sigma algebra generated by coin tosses we can distinguish between head tail and tail head okay because that information was available to us in the sigma algebra 
but the sigma algebra that was generated by S2, we couldn't really differentiate between a head tail and a tail head, okay, but because that information wasn't available to us. So you can see that F2 basically has some extra information available, which basically this sigma algebra doesn't have, okay. And you know, basically, if you look at the significance of sigma algebra generated by uh, a random variable S2, so this sigma algebra is the, is the smallest sigma algebra, okay? And this is important to actually understand that this is the smallest sigma algebra that basically makes S2 measurable, okay? So if, so this is the smallest sigma algebra that makes, makes S2 measurable. All the other information which is there in F2 is not relevant to making S2 measurable, okay? So if these sets are resolved, and this is the smallest sigma algebra, that will make random variable S2 measurable, okay? So that's one concept to understand that sigma algebra generated by S2 basically is the smallest sigma algebra that basically makes S2 measurable, okay? So that's something to understand. Now let's look at another important concept.